How's it going y'all? Let's take a deep dive into the context package in Go. This package has many uses and as a result can be kind of hard to understand, but by the end of this short video, I promise you'll be a pro. We're going to cover how to use context to set time limits on code execution, how to use context to pass around data in your code, and some real world examples with some common packages. Let's dive right in with an example to get a feel of how you can use context in your own code. Here I got a function which opens a connection to say some streaming service. Inside, there's a 50% chance that the connection hangs, essentially forever. We've all seen the spinning loading bar from time to time where no matter how long you wait, nothing happens. That's essentially this. Then there's also a 50% chance that we establish a connection within a couple seconds. Now I know that this function is kind of unreliable. It might, it might not establish a connection. I want to have the ability to set the max time I can try to connect for, beyond which I can close the connection, maybe retry, and so on. So let's see how we can do that by making an open connection with timeout function and import the context package. So to create a context, we use the context.background function. This will return a new context, which is of the type context.context. .context. Let's take a look at the source code for this and see what we can learn. So the context we get back satisfies this interface. It has a deadline, a done, an error, and a value function. Our first code example is going to use the done function. This returns a channel. So remember, channels allow different Go routines to communicate with each other, sending and receiving messages from other Go routines. Now what we've just created is an empty context. If we want to add timeout functionality to the context, we wrap our context with a timeout function. This will take our context and a timeout value which we specify. Here we set two minutes. So this will return both a new context and a cancel function. The cancel function we want to make sure to call before exiting. So we use a defer statement. What this does is if we finish our task before the timeout and are about to exit this function, we manually terminate the context. For example, if we finish our task in two seconds, then there's no need for the context to keep counting in the background for another minute and 58 seconds. We just terminate it. Now we're going to actually run our open connection function as a go routine. We'll see why in a second. In addition, we're going to make a custom channel for tracking the progress of this go routine. We do this with a make keyword. So this channel will return a Boolean value. This will track when our function successfully opens a connection. So we'll pass this channel into our open connection function. At the bottom, when the connection is established, we'll write true to the channel. Okay, so how do we use this in conjunction with the context timeout? Well, this is where a select statement will work nicely. We're going to set up two cases and go through each case. Remember, we saw that the done function in the context struct returns a channel. So initially, there's no value in either one of these channels. The select statement will wait for these two cases, and whichever channel returns a value first, that's the code that will be executed. Let's try this out and see what happens. But first, let's update this timeout to three seconds for demonstration. So when we run the program the first time, we happen to not hang. The task took two seconds to execute, and we got a connection successful result. The second time we run this, we hit our hanging connection. But instead of hanging forever, our context timed out, and we got our timeout message. So this toy example just gives you insight into A, how you can use context yourself, and also how other packages use them when you pass in a context. Let's take a look at some example packages which use context and how they work. Here's an example of connecting to a database I have running locally. I create the context with timeout, then when I'm connecting to the database, the connection function takes that context. Also, I can ping the database to test the connection, and here I pass in the same context. So note that in this example, since the context timer starts the moment it's created, we're setting the requirement that both the connection and the pinging to the server must happen within 10 seconds. So if the connection function takes 6 seconds and the ping function takes 5 seconds, the context time limit is exceeded in this case. So an error will be returned by the ping function. Now a lot of the time you want to create multiple contexts for different use cases. For example, I'm going to create another context here with only a 5 second limit. I'm going to use this context for querying the user collection in my database.
So let's try this code out. All right, so I have my database running and when I run the code, everything executes smoothly. I get my document back and I print out the document ID. Now, if I stop my locally running database and run the code again, we wait for 10 seconds and we get the context deadline exceeded error. Similarly, the HTTP package also lets you use context when making HTTP requests. Again, we create a new context with timeout and here we use the new request with context function. Passing in the context is the first argument. Then we can check for an error in our request, which will be returned if our request takes longer than 10 seconds. Finally, let's use this example to see how we can use a couple other functions we saw in the source code. So the error and the deadline functions are really little helper functions. The deadline function is used to check when the context will time out. We can print out the value if a deadline was set, Otherwise, the context doesn't have any expiry set. The error function is used to get the context error directly. For example, here, rather than printing out the error returned by the HTTP client, we print out the error returned by the context. Finally, let's take a look at the value function and how it relates to the second aspect of context, which is passing around data. We can store values in the context by using the with value function, passing in a new context and setting the key and value pair. To get back the value, we use the value function passing in the key. And then casting the result to the proper type, which for us is a string. We can add multiple key value pairs just by repassing in the same context. Now the main use case for this is actually middleware. If you're not up to date on middleware, you can check out my dedicated video on the topic. Otherwise, let's just create an API with a simple hello endpoint and a hello handler. This grabs a username from our database using the user ID passed in and returns a message. Now I also have this authentication middleware which checks the username and password passed in match what we have in our database. So first the authentication function gets called. Then if we pass authentication, the hello handler will get called. One thing to note is that both functions query the database for the exact same data. Instead of making these expensive network calls, contexts are often used in these cases to store and reuse data. So in our auth function, the request type has a context it uses. We can grab it using the context function. Now we use this context to add a username field. So we're getting a new context back here, which is the same as the old one, plus storing some additional data. And we can pass this context along like this. Now in our hello handler, we can grab the context from the request and use the value function to get the username. Now we've avoided making multiple database calls. Instead, we're just passing around the data we need across the different functions. All right, so that's essentially how the go context package works and how to use it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.